Simon Erickson. Welcome to talk. 7 Investing the Now, a show that teaches you how to take a long-term view on investing by better understanding there, what's but, uh, happening in the market For those of you who are just tuning in, my name is Daniel brooks Klein. You are watching 7 Investing Now. I'm being joined by Matt Cochran and Simon Erickson. Uh, we're going to talk about the housing market. We are also going to talk about the sort of unofficial. We haven't heard President Joe Biden's official capital gains tax plan, but markets tanked yesterday because of rumors of his plan. Uh, and then we are going to talk about whether we really have to consider regulating the use of AI. AI is a little bit scary. Think of like the uh, when you get the speeding ticket in the mail that you didn't know you got, it's like 80 bucks because you like kind of went through a red light. AI could be dramatically worse. Matt Cochran, how are you? I'm doing all right, Dan. Getting ready for the weekend. Simon Erickson, going to share a little bit of a personal story here, but it's very hot here in Florida, and it's very dry inside. So I've been getting spontaneous nosebleeds, which is really, <laughs> really not pleasant. So if anyone knows a cure for nosebleeds, uh, share that in the comments. We, of course, would like to take your questions and comments. Uh, Simon, what is going on in, in the city of Houston? Now, we're going to talk about that as a real estate market, but... In general, there's a lot of people moving there, right? There is, yeah. Houston, Austin. It seems like all around Texas. I just had a conversation about people moving to Waco. It seems like a lot of parts of Texas are getting a few more residents these days. Hey, good for Waco getting over what it's most known for. So, like, you know, that's a that that, that is absolutely that that's a little bit like moving to you know Tehran or like someplace like the reputation is not great. But we're gonna do a deep dive into the housing market. When I say that. What do I mean? At the end of 2020, home prices were about 15% higher than a year earlier. Uh, a lot of that was pandemic driven. And the growth is widespread. Uh, about 88% of metropolitan regions, home prices have experienced double digit price growth. We're going to talk about our personal stories on this, but I want to get into some of the numbers. And of course, mortgage rates are near historic lows. They've been hovering there for a long time. Basically, mortgage companies have had to pick and choose who they process, like especially in terms of refinances, there's been quite a bit, quite a big line. Uh, I know one of you, I don't know which one because there's no note in the show, wanted to talk about mortgage or origination. So uh, Matt or Simon, whoever grabbed that chart, well, yeah, feel so, free I to mean, jump in. Yeah, no, it, it, just, it just shows you that like, I mean, people are, they're, they're out buying houses. And I mean, there's a, we actually have a chart for that. Just like or, mortgage originations have just exploded in the last year. They're at like a, I don't know if it's an all time high, but it's certainly a, a 10 year high. Uh, same. Do we have that chart that we can put up? But like, um, and there's two huge, like uh, demographic trends behind that. And there's a big overlap actually between these trends. The first one is like, there's Hispanic homeowner households has risen by more than 700,000 in 2020 to nearly 9 million. Uh, that's according to Census Bureau data compiled by the National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals. Um, that gain marked the biggest one-year increase in data on Hispanic home ownership going back more than two decades. And so why is that growing? Well, their buying power continues to grow. Uh, Hispanic buying power continues to grow as individu individuals enter their early 30s, the most typical years for first-time homebuyers. Uh, Hispanics in the U.S. have a median age of 30 in 2019, which was about 14 years younger than the median age for non-Hispanic white Americans. Um, so while Hisp Hispanics make up about 18% of the country's population, they account for more than half of the country's home ownership growth in the decade leading up to the pandemic. Um, and that growth is expected to continue. The Urban Institute projected that between 2020 and 2040, 70% of net new homeowner households will be Hispanic. Well, and if you looked at, if you, if you listen to like their ages, well, that that's millennial, that's the millennial age, right? That's the millennial demographic. And so the, the Hispanic population has a huge millennial uh, population within it. And millennials are buying houses uh, between the ages of 25 and 29, that age group. Um, they're increasingly buying their first uh, homes and 30 to 34 year olds are doing so even at higher rates. In 2019, millennials accounted for half of all home loans and that stayed above the 50% mark through the first month of 2020. Um, some studies state that America's largest generation, the millennials could account for as many as 15 million home purchases in the next decade. That's a lot. <laughs> That's a lot is putting it mildly. So we lost Sam Bailey for a bit there. Uh, so I promise you there was a graphic. It was very pretty. Matt put a lot of work into it, uh, but uh, we will have to show it on another show. 
we are seeing millennials buy more houses. Uh, we are seeing uh, the Hispanic population buy more houses. But Simon, we're also seeing a population shift and that's at least partly driven by the pandemic. That's happening there in Houston where your internet is scotch tape and, and uh, you know soup cans put together. <laughs> Why don't you talk a little bit about what some of the factors are that are driving uh, a change in where people live and higher prices in many, many markets? Yeah, absolutely, Dan. And great points that Matt made also about the long-term trends, the demographic trends, you know, Hispanics buying houses, millennials buying houses. I mean, the housing market as a whole is just this giant relationship between the supply curve and the demand curve, right? You can only build new houses so quickly uh, and you've got existing homes that are out there. And so when you've got more buyers that are starting to buy homes, that pushes up the prices, which is exactly what we're seeing right now. And so in addition to what you just said, like you, to your question, Dan, is we have a migration of jobs too. And this was kind of accelerated by COVID, which is moving people out of San Francisco and into Austin. And that's what we've been seeing here, you know, so closely in Texas is you've got Tesla moving out there. You've got a lot of the tech companies that want to be in Austin. People that are coming from San Francisco think this is amazing because you can now buy a much larger house for less money. But we're also starting to see that into other markets as well. Miami, Florida is seeing the same thing. A lot of places in the South, uh, we're certainly experiencing the same thing in Houston. But another one of those long-term demographic shifts is with, um, with, the, with the technology jobs kind of shifting to other parts of the country. Yeah, we're seeing more jobs become portable. And I know that as someone who's worked from home for the best part of like seven years, a couple years in, I looked around and went, why exactly do I live in Connecticut where it's cold and, and uncomfortable? And that's when I turned to my wife and I said, do you really like your job? Like maybe we should move. And we started looking at what we could buy. And for what we were spending in Connecticut, uh, we could buy the condo we're in the process of selling. It was a downtown condo, walking distance to everything. We could live in a sort of small city, which was always a, a dream of mine. Tons of restaurants, tons of bars, things to do. And the lifestyle appealed. Back then, not many people had that option. Now, an increasing amount of people are having that option. We're also seeing a, let's call it a, a premature shift to the suburbs. People tend to shift to the suburbs as they retire or as they have kids that sort of no longer want to sleep in a drawer in their New York apartment. We saw those people during the pandemic go, Ugh, I don't want to live in New York City and spend five grand a month for a, a two bedroom. I'll, I'll go live in Jersey City or someplace that's, you know, or, or Connecticut or wherever it is. We're seeing those multiple types of migrations. Uh, some of it is job driven. Some of it is lifestyle driven. Uh, I'll throw this to Simon. Simon, do you think this is a long term trend or that many companies are going to realize that they actually want workers to be back in the office at some point. And maybe maybe this doesn't become this whole work wherever you want revolution we've had for the past year. No, I think those are long-term trends, Dan. I, I think that there's definitely a migration of jobs to being remote. I think that some of that comes back, that is no doubt in my mind, a long-term trend that's developing. And the demographic trends that Matt talked about too are also long-term trends. Uh, if I could spend a, a moment to speak about some of the short-term uh, impacts to the housing market as well. I think that both of those are even more accelerated by COVID and by, of course, interest rates. Uh, Matt mentioned millennials and millennials are buying houses. Yes, of course, that's a long-term trend that people are getting older and buying homes and having families. But in addition to that, when you're getting loans uh, that are sometimes two and a half or 3% for a home, yeah, you take advantage of that when the money is cheap. And we just saw, I just read a study yeah, a couple of days ago that was showing that millennials in particular now have a very, very high savings rate due to COVID. And in fact, maybe we can try another chart here. We got a lot of charts for this one, Sam, <laughs> but if you can show up the Federal Reserve data that shows the personal savings rate, there it is, perfect. Over the last, oh, what is that, 20 years or so, uh, you can see we typically have people saving about 5% of the income that they make in any given year, right? In the left-hand side of this chart, but then look at how that's kind of just inched up in 2010, 2015, and then, of course, the spike from COVID, we've had some periods of COVID there that people were saving 30% of their paychecks just because they had nothing to spend it on. You couldn't go out and do anything. And that's settled down, Dan, but we're still seeing it above 10%. Thanks very much, Sam, for the chart. And There's I think part of that is, is especially millennials that say, hey, I don't know what to do with my money. I'm sitting on a lot of cash right now. 57% of millennials say they have more than $10,000 in their bank account right now compared to 41% a year ago. Um, and so where do you put it to use? You go after real estate, which is at historically low interest rates. There's only so much you can spend on Grubhub. There are only so many dumb purchases you can make on Amazon. I don't think we're playing up enough in the overall housing market, the incredible benefit of low mortgages. Uh, so Sam, if you want to share that chart, I will share that when we bought our first house, 
my mortgage rate was roughly 8%. Uh, when we bought our most recent house, our mortgage was like three and three quarters. Uh, and now, Matt, you can see this better than I can. Uh, Matt, where are mortgage rates coming out right about now? Hey, they're right, almost right at 3%. And that's like, uh, I mean, that's just at a low from, I mean, it, like you said, Dan, like, I mean, when my parents bought a house in the 80s, I mean, the mortgage rate was uh, probably in double digits, you know, and even the last 10 years, while interest rates have been very low, we're at a, like, you know, this last year, we've seen a new 10 year low. So even amongst this period of historically low interest rates, we're still at a new all time low. So we're going to see some long-term shifts. And, uh, in a minute, we're going to bring in Sam Bailey because we're going to talk about millennial home buying with someone who is a millennial. But the one shift that I think that gets overplayed, and, and Simon, I'll, I'll get your opinion on this because you live in a tech city. There's been a lot of talk. And of course, we'll take your questions and comments. We see them piling up a little bit. Um, there's been a lot of talk about sort of like the death of New York City and Seattle and San Francisco. And here's the reality available apartments for sale in New York hit like a 10 year high, it was still only like 22,000 apartments. Yes, it is easier to rent an apartment in New York and, and rates are down, but you have to put that in perspective. When my brother lived in New York, he had a one bedroom that was $5,000 a month. He is now living in London in a much nicer two bedroom for less than that. So New York, Seattle, uh, San Francisco were very, very expensive and there's some pullback, but it's not like you're gonna walk into New York and buy a you know a two bedroom on the Upper West Side for 400 grand. You're gonna spend maybe 780 instead of 800. These aren't giant collapses. And all the reasons people wanted to live in those cities, you're not seeing tech companies pull out of Seattle. They may move some workers to Austin. They may open in you know the greater DC area or, or Microsoft has people in Boston. You, you might see a spread out. You're seeing Miami offices and that makes sense to lure more talent but I don't think you're going to see the leadership of big companies pull out of these cities. I don't think you're going to see, you know, the financial services industries that are based in New York. I don't think you're going to see them leave New York. Now, might some of them move some offices to Stanford, Connecticut or White Plains? Yeah, that's been happening. So I do think you're going to see a spread out. Simon, you talked about how in Houston you're, you expect to get some business when people get fed up with the traffic in Austin. I feel the same way here in West Palm. I think uh, they are building office space, a top tier office space, multiple buildings, and way above market apartments. You're not building $600,000 two bedroom apartments because you think the existing populace is gonna buy it. You think there will be some shift. Simon, which of these shifts are permanent and which are sort of being overplayed? Man, what a great question. I mean, we've, we've kind of seen migration. Like, you remember remember the the shale boom of, of the kind of, you know, North Dakota and South Dakota, where just everybody was flooding into those areas because uh, the price of natural gas was going up. So all the energy companies were sending people out and paying them two hundred $300,000 to go out there. And it was just a spike that was not sustainable. That did not last. It's a commodity price that was cyclical. Um, the the question here is, if, if people are moving from San Francisco to other areas, those going remote doesn't just mean going remote anywhere, right? That's a big jump to go from uh, from San Francisco to Topeka, Kansas or Oklahoma City. But if there is a surrounding uh, uh, ecosystem, so to speak, you know, you've got accelerators, you've got um, access to financial capital. If you've got, uh, you know, angel investors, people that want, you know, like-minded tech people, it's kind of cities are trying to create these innovation hubs. Uh, which we're very aware of here in Houston. And I know that from living in Austin, Austin's exactly the same way, where you try to attract those jobs, and you try to attract those people, but you also put a lot of money into supporting entrepreneurs and kind of starting that same startup mentality. And so I, I think that you're right, Dan, that um, this isn't just happening where people are migrating all across the world. You're starting to start seeing these hubs kind of popping up. Um, they might not have been thought of as tech entrepreneurial cities like Houston or, or Miami might have been thought of differently 20 years ago than today. But I do think that there's going to be a lot more attention to uh, local governments and kind of the surrounding ecosystem that's supporting entrepreneurs and startups, because all of that bubbles up uh, in terms of housing and in terms of the community. You also need physical infrastructure. So besides housing, you need internet. And so there are opportunities here. We're already seeing T-Mobile take advantage. T-Mobile is going into underserved internet markets and putting in 5G. Now, that probably doesn't mean downtown Houston, but if you've ever been to Houston, it is a sprawling metropolitan area. Well, frankly, so is uh, Orlando or, or West Palm Beach. There are lots of places you could live as a tech worker adjacent to those cities that are underserved when it comes to internet. So 
you're going to see opportunities. You know, do I think the Comcast of the world, uh, not to bag on them, are, are necessarily going to take advantage? No, but I do think T-Mobile has been very proactive in identifying areas. Um, they've, they've really expanded into rural New Hampshire. Why? Because people who work in Boston might have moved to rural New Hampshire because houses are cheaper. And if you only have to go in two days a week, that hour long commute, which turns into two hours because Boston is a terrible traffic city, uh, becomes much more viable. So when people are looking at investing plays here, yes, there are some home builders you could buy. There are obviously some suppliers, uh, but you can also look at who's going to take get adva take advantage of gaining new customers. And if you look at companies that have gained the most new companies, customers consistently, it's been T-Mobile. I'll, I'll joke a little bit. There's a massive opportunity for Domino's and Chipotle and Starbucks because I've driven around Texas. Uh, and when you drive around Texas, you actually see them serial constructing lookalike towns. And then you drive four miles down and you'll see roughly the same town. And it'll have this similar town center with a grocery store, a Starbucks, a Chipotle, or whatever. You're going to see a population shift that adds opportunity. Now, does that mean some urban stores that served office buildings might close? Yes, you'll you'll see you know a little bit of that shakeout. Uh, but I want to talk personal experiences on the home on the home market and bring Sam Bailey in. Uh, so all of us, I've bought something like eighteen homes in the past like twenty years, and I'm in the process. I just sold my condo, and I'm trying or I haven't sold it. We're under contract, and I'm desperately trying to buy a resort property. And we literally made an over offering price bid. Uh, that we don't expect to be accepted. So we have a cash bid above what they're asking and we don't expect to get it. But Sam, you've only lived in your house for a few years and you're looking at the situation of, oh my God, I could sell my house for dramatically more than I paid for it, but there is a drawback to that, right? Well, that's what we were saying. We could sell our house, make an enormous profit, but where do we go? We can make this, have all this extra money in the bank and be homeless. So that kind of defeats the purpose of, you know, having a pretty flush savings account. And that is, so So Sam's house is worth roughly what, 200,000 more than you paid for it? Yes. And that difference could buy you a perfectly nice home in many parts of the country. The problem is you have physical ties to where you are. So as we see this market shake out, there are gonna be people who could take advantage. Like you're seeing some, uh, some smaller states or some states with less population offer tax incentives or, or sometimes flat out payouts for people to come live there. Go live in Vermont and we'll give you 12 grand. I, I don't think that's still in existence, but that was a program early on in the pandemic. Uh, Matt, I'll come back to you here. Uh, is there anything else you're seeing? Uh, and then we'll take some of the questions and comments. And Sam, feel free to stick around if you like. Well, the, the only thing I would say, Dan, is I, you almost have this this perfect storm driving up housing prices. You have long-term trends like demographic trends where millennials are, are buying their, their first homes. You have short-term catalysts like COVID where people wanted to move out of the city and have a house with a backyard uh, during like stay at home orders and, and things like that. You have low interest rates, another short-term catalyst. And you also have like a, a lower housing supply out of the great financial crisis. Home builders have not ramped up their, their home builder um, the, the number of new homes being built for almost a decade. So you have like a lower number of homes, like new homes being built than you might've had historically. So you have this like almost this perfect storm. Like, so our homes an, an inflated asset? I, I don't know. Like, I mean, with the low interest rates, people can afford more, um, more home uh, for the same monthly payments. And there's a lot of, you know, it, at the end of the day, it's going to be a supply and demand question. Um, I don't know. I don't think they can go up like this forever, obviously. But like, you know, I, I don't think it's a, it's a bubble by any means. And here's the bet you're making. So it's a bubble in some markets. Uh, the example I'll give is a, a, a mutual friend of ours is looking to buy a, a very high end home in the Orlando area. And they're priced double at what they were a year ago because there's so much interest. And at, at a certain price point, it almost doesn't matter to people. So that is a bubble that could pop. The bet Sam would be taking, and Sam, this is why I wanted you back on, you could in theory sell your house and rent, maybe live someplace less nice, less comfortable, if you believe that two or three years from now, the Houston market is going to burst and you can buy back in. That's essentially what my wife and I are doing, but we're doing it with the idea that our geography, once we don't have a kid in school, doesn't matter as much. So I could move anywhere within like an hour radius of her office 
Uh, and that gives me the ability to move to markets that are less expensive. If you're stuck to one market with kids in school, you have to bet that that market is going to tank. And Simon, I do not expect that Houston is not going to be a long-term climb. Do you agree? Oh, go ahead, Sam. I'll chime in too, but go ahead. <laughs> I, was, I don't know what I've missed already, but Simon and I were talking about this before the show, that some of these tech companies don't want to go to Austin anymore, and they're coming to Houston. So I don't know if we'd be able to buy that in. So we're just going to hold tight and... Hope that that's the right decision. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's a very think is that the, the biggest winners is if you want to retire, right? If you've, if you've had a house in the city and you've been commuting for 20 years and you say, hey, gosh, my house is worth two or three hundred thousand dollars more than I, than I paid for it. You know, we're going to put that money right into retirement. And I don't really want to go back to work when they start sending me back to the office again. That's the best case scenario. Maybe that has an impact on the labor markets. We'll see. I also think we're going to see some new innovation here. We're going to take Mike Fee's question on lumber after I finish here. But one of the buildings that's built near me, it's actually at the base of that high-speed train we were talking for. It's literally on top of the station. And it's tiny apartments. And tiny apartments had generally been something that sells for vacationers or low-income housing. These are very expensive, like $2,000 a month, you know, 300 square foot apartments based around the idea of that there's communal space, there's a pool, there's a clubhouse, and that younger people might live there because most of their living is going to occur outside. It's, you know, the house is like, it's kind of like your room on a cruise ship. Like, yeah, you go there to change and take a shower. It's not really that important. I think you might also see, and I've talked about this before, some co-living spaces with the idea that you might live two hours outside of San Francisco or Seattle. And frankly, two hours outside of Seattle is like six miles when you look at the commute there. Um, and you might live in a house that's still crazy expensive, still $800,000 for a three bedroom, but three or four days a week, you might sleep at sort of a modified hotel where you have like a, a sleep bunk and everything else is shared space. There's obviously legal concerns there and, and lots of things you have to do, but I do think you're gonna see some shifts uh, you might even see some companies operate commuter flights where, you know, Monday morning you get on a plane in the Las Vegas area and fly into LA or San Francisco or, or wherever, work there for the week because it's much more affordable to live in the Las Vegas area. You could buy a really nice house for a couple hundred thousand dollars. You can't buy a really nice shoebox for that in, in San Francisco. So I think we're going to see big changes, but there are some other pressures on the housing market. Uh, Sam, if you want to bring up Mike Fee's comment on lumber, we are happy to take that. Uh, lumber prices are up 230% in the last year. Fixed cost for building uh, an 1800 square foot house costs 20 to 25,000 more now than a year ago. Matt, you're gonna talk about this. I'll say, I have firsthand experience on this. I used to buy wooden planks for scaffolding when I worked in my family business. And I would have to constantly negotiate you know, with, with my aunt, who was essentially the bank who runs the company, when prices were low, could I buy some and just sit on it? Because when prices were high, they could double and you're still renting it at the same rate. But Matt, what's your take on how this is impacting the housing market? Uh, no, it's it's absolutely right. I mean, there's not too much to add. I mean, like lumber prices are absolutely up. A lot of commodity prices are up in the last year. Now, a lot of those are coming off of like, we're coming off lows. But I mean, like, there's no doubt, like lumber prices are up a lot. There was a meme the other day going around on, on like some uh, Twitter accounts, like, you know, where there was a picture of a, a guy going down the highway with a truck loaded up with uh, lumber. And the, the caption was, I passed a billionaire today on the way to work. You know, uh, you know, lumber prices are up just an extraordinary amount. <laughs> Uh, over the last year. Uh, there's no doubt. There's no doubt like building costs like that will absolutely, you know, we're we already talked about home builders building less homes. Well, you know, that's those kinds of things are going to make home builders like more reluctant to like really ramp up their uh, inventory in, in schedule two, because they're going to be investing a lot of money right now in these kinds of supplies to build houses. So all these things like will definitely pressure the market. Matt, a lot of houses here in Florida are built with cinder blocks. In fact, I think anything new of a certain, in most areas, has to be built with cinder blocks. Uh, that doesn't mean there's no lumber, but there's significantly less lumber than a house in, say, Massachusetts. Do you think we're going to see you know, new building materials and sort of added innovation in that area? I have no idea. <laughs> possibly. Po possibly. I, I really don't know. Uh, it, it's, it's definitely possible. Like uh, cinder blocks and concrete really all I know. You know, I've lived in South Florida almost my entire life. But uh, like, uh, so, so who knows? I, I don't know. I, I, I actually think you're going to see an increase in modular homes. I don't mean modular homes like mobile homes. I mean a home built in a factory that gets put on a foundation that becomes something permanent. Uh, I want to take Max Lucas's uh, first comment. And then uh, Simon, I'll let you pick a comment to take uh, as we close up here. 
In my town of 300,000 in Washington state, we saw our housing inventory, which had stayed steady at 1,500 for over the past 10 years, uh, and is now at 150 homes available, down 90%. Yeah, this has been happening all over the country, especially places that have infrastructure that are nice places to live. Prices in say like, uh, you know, the major cities in the Carolinas have gone up dramatically because you've got a combination of decent weather and low prices. Simon, I see a lot of comments, so feel free to, uh, to tee up whichever one you'd like. Well, maybe one from Mike, you know, Mike's got some great comments on the side. The one that I like is, is one that he says, people might want to buy a new house, but will eventually be priced out. Housing looks like an inflated asset. Yeah. So, I mean, like whether it's a long-term or short-term trend, if people are moving to different cities and businesses are moving to different cities, uh, I think my, my, my sneaky play on this as an investor might be Airbnb. And, and I say that because as someone who traveled basically every month for four years to conferences and to businesses to speak with and get interviews, um, unless you were wanting to pay $600 for a Courtyard Marriott just to be close to the conference center, you had to stay at Airbnbs. And people were super excited to have guests that were um, trustable, you know, pay them for those nights because it helped them offset their own costs too. So if we're seeing inflated uh, housing prices and uh, kind of new pockets of people moving, I, I kind of think this distributed uh, Airbnb model might have kind of some interesting implications for that. You're also seeing a lot of investor money buy homes that previously would have been owner occupied and they're putting them on the long-term rental market. Uh, we've gone through this before, but where I'm living now, basically if a unit comes up it has three or four offers, sight unseen, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and that's not typical in rentals. So we, there were places uh, where we wanted at least four bedrooms where we couldn't see a four bedroom unit. We would literally just have to make an offer based on a floor plan and some pictures. Uh, and we weren't willing to do that. So it was really tricky to find a place to live. You know, right now there, there's, plenty of one and two bedrooms. But when you get into three and four bedrooms, it's very difficult because you did have an influx of people, which may not be permanent, from New York who wanted to live in Florida during the pandemic. And the prices here, you know, I'm paying $2,500 a month for a four bedroom, 2,200 square foot house with a pool and a luxury gym. In New York, that's a studio. So, you know, the prices seem very, very low, hard to know. And from an investing point of view, I'm not so sure I'm buying a four bedroom house as a rental in an area that West Palm is not a touristy area. So that might be a different play in say Orlando or someplace where you could Airbnb it uh, or, or you, you could you know, rent it to a snowbird seasonally. So I do think people should be careful with their investment. We've had a couple of comments about inflation. Inflation is a risk, and Matt, I know you want to talk about this, but I don't view inflation as that much of a risk if you're buying a home that you intend to live in for the long term. If you're buying a home to flip it, inflation is a risk. If you're buying a home for three to five years, absolutely short-term market conditions. But if you're buying a home to live in, you know, to raise your family, I'm not so sure you really want to factor in because you, as much as you have to think about price, you also have to think in what value did I get out of this home? Did I raise my kids here? Did we enjoy the backyard? You know, did, did Matt's kids play in the pool? Whatever it is. But Matt, I know you wanted to comment on this one as well. No, absolutely. So like the, what, what I would say is it's like, actually, I think like uh, buying a home on, on a long mortgage at a low interest rate is a terrific hedge against inflation. If you're really worried about inflation and trying to predict inflation is above my pay grade. I, I do see reasons why there are concerns for inflation. I don't know if those reasons are going to come to fruition because there's a lot of like factors at play there. But if you are concerned about inflation, I actually think, again, borrowing a lot of money to buy a fixed asset at a very low interest rate is a terrific hedge. In, in 30 years, you're, the money, the money you're, the monthly payment you're paying on your house, if inflation becomes a big thing, that payment's going to seem very, very, very small. And, uh, and your home value will have gone up because of inflation. So um, buying a home, if you're worried about inflation, I think is a terrific hedge. I'm an aggressive home buyer and seller. My wife and I literally moved buying and selling the first 11 years we lived together. And we've Ooh. done it four or five times. And the idea was I would look at the market. I would see that we could sell our house at a significant premium and that either unlocked a nicer place to live for us or put some cash in our pocket. So that's kind of what we're doing now. We're selling out at a, at a pretty significant premium on what we paid, about 50% higher than we paid. And then we're going to buy an income producing property and in theory, uh, use that money that we produce 
to at some point buy back in when the market where we live has calmed down and our needs become more flexible in a year or two when my son is no longer in school. I want to close out. Uh, I'll give Simon a chance to to make one more comment. But well, I, wanna, then I, I just wanted to ask, did you say that you bought 18 houses in 20 years? Did I hear that correctly? I think that's rough. I think that's roughly the number. If you count um, we owned a vacation property in West Palm before we lived here. We also currently own a, uh, a manufactured home in the Orlando area that we will sell uh, once we buy the place where we're looking. <laughs> yeah, and, and Steve, I am kind of day trading houses. That's impressive. Because, That's impressive. You know, when you look at an asset, we only got burned once. We in two thousand eight. We, we needed a nicer place. We bought it and they, the builder paid our mortgage for four months and it took us the full four months to sell uh, our existing place because the housing market crashed. We didn't take a bath, but it wasn't great. And when we sold our house in Connecticut to move here, if we'd sold it about three months later, we probably would have done about $30,000 better. The market really you know, caught on fire, but we sold our vacation property here that we paid 80 grand for, which we sold for, I wanna say 113. So we made up a lot of what we did, but I do look at you know, what, it, what is in my hand? How many chips do I have to put on the table? And if I can turn it into some cash, or in this case, the vacation property we're looking at, we're gonna own fully. So it's kind of a hedge against retirement or things going wrong. But Simon Erickson, I will give you the last word before we move to what we're watching. No, great points. I, I don't actually have anything else to add. I think that we, we hit the high notes. This is a trend that you got to keep an eye on for the what's long term and what's short term and play it accordingly. Before we get to what we're watching. So what I spent most of yesterday and, and part of today doing is writing up my recommendation for next month. What we do, our core product here at 7investing is our seven highest conviction stock picks, uh, which you can buy for $17 a month. But why would you do that? Why would you not pay $170 a year and get two months for free? This is a, you know, this is a hamburger helper price for a filet mignon at Morton's, or you know, or or the or the or the, the bone-in filet at uh, at the steakhouse I ate in at South Carolina, whose names are escaping me, which is the best steak I've ever had. Uh, so you're getting tremendous value here. So we all do a write-up. We have already recorded our pitch sessions where we spend 20 minutes to a half hour explaining to our fellow lead advisors why we're picking this. And I'll know, I'll, I'll note that Simon came at me pretty hard this month with questions about my, my stock because it is a fairly risky pick. And it's not that it's not a company you know, everyone believes in long term, but there are things that could go wrong. So you get to see the bull case and the bear case. So this isn't just, hey, buy this stock. This is, this is why we're buying the stock. This is why it's important to us. I will say that there are stocks I'd never heard of that I now want to own. Uh, there are a couple of stocks that I already own because of 7investing advisors. Uh, but Simon, how do people get a 7investing subscription if they'd like to sign up? Yep, Dan, and I know you still love me and I still love you even when I ask tough questions in our team calls like that, as we encourage all of our advisors to do. I, I think that's the point, actually. And I'm looking forward to the month where I really believe in my pick and someone changes my mind or points something out that I didn't see. And it is possible that we would say, you know what? I'm not going to make that. I, you know what? I'll, I'll re-rec something I picked before or my idea, you know, 2A maybe seems better. Now, that's not what happened. I had good answers for what Simon was asking, but it also made me change how I wrote it up because when I wrote it up, I wanted to clearly address the risk and concerns for this company. Um, so we all make each other better. And I think yeah, that's one sure. of the, the most exciting things about 7investing. And honestly, our community makes us better too, because you ask us so many great questions on this live show. And the conviction, course, Dan, on the Twitter. Convic Dan, the conviction you showed in JCPenney's turnaround though, amazing. <laughs> I just good. couldn't believe it. <laughs> I asked some good questions too. I gotta say, Matt, you, you, you win the award, I think, for tough questions on those calls as well. So if you would like to subscribe, that is 7investing.com slash subscribe. I promise you it is worth it. Uh, it. Everyone is happy. It is a wonderful community. You get access to our members only calls. You get access to the new member call where we walk you through how the system works. We are constantly evolving and improving the, the, the process. Uh, we've been taking sections from 7investing now putting the video up starting at that section and giving you a full edited transcript. We actually have an operations team uh, that's editing those transcripts. And uh, thank you guys for doing that. That's just another way that maybe you missed the show and don't have time to listen to it, but you really want to hear our talk on uh, the capital gains tax. Whatever it is, it's available on our site as well as tons of members only exclusive. But Matt, 
President well, Joe Biden. If, if I could, Dan, just chime yeah. in a, a moment on this too, because something you said just a second ago is something that's very true, which is that we're giving you the Lexus for the Toyota price, right? And we've got two people on the team that have run services before, and we kind of know that we're pricing ourselves purposely at below market rates of what we could be charging, because we want to democratize investing. We want people to be more actionable and involved in the stock market and taking control of their future finances. And I think that the other part that goes along with that is exactly what you said, which is not just, we're not just throwing out tickers out there and saying, oh, you know, here's, here's five ideas today and five ideas tomorrow. I mean, we really do some very thorough research that goes into those reports. And then my favorite part, which is something you mentioned, is the subscriber call we do every month where we say, hey, here is our recommendation. We are live in front of our, our subscribers and saying, let, me, let us show you our conviction and let us answer these questions you have about these stocks. That's not something that I've seen that you get in other places. I really think it shows the conviction we have in this team and the incredible thorough analysis that goes in every one of these picks. Um, the testimonials we've received have been fantastic and I'm really, really proud of everything that we're doing. And we all put in a lot of effort to fig to narrow down our picks. We're all following tons and tons of companies. People will throw us ideas and we'll see them and we'll be, you know, absolutely intrigued. I know there's more than one app on my phone, uh, you know, because it's a company I was thinking about picking and in some cases didn't actually have a good experience, which is why I didn't pick said company, which I won't mention. Uh, but let's seg to what we're watching. Uh, President Biden wants to increase the capital gains tax. That's sort of came out as a rumor yesterday. The planned increase would, would be to essentially the income tax rate, but only for people making over a million dollars a year. Matt, this sent markets tumbling yesterday. Can you first just sort of explain what capital gains is and then explain sort of why this happened yesterday? Sure, yeah, absolutely. So a capital gains tax is just a tax on the growth and the value of your investments incurred. So like whenever, uh, and it's only, it's only, it's not charged for when, uh, when gains are unrealized, meaning like when you hold an asset, like it can go up for forever and you'll never be charged a capital gains tax for that. It's only charged when you, when you sell that asset. So for like stocks, like, um, you know, if you, you, you hold a stock X for a hundred percent gain and you sell your, your soul, you're taxed on those gains. Um, now the, what Biden is proposing is for, like you said, Dan, it's for, uh, income earners that earn more than $1 million a, a, a year. And they're, they're proposing to raise the rate from about 24% to about 44%. Uh, so it is a substantial gain. Uh, you know, like really only, only two things I would add, Dan. So like, look, first of all, look, whether this is good, like a good thing for income inequality or, or raising money for infrastructure or anything like that, I'm going to stay out of that. That's like above my pay grade. And it's just questions that, you know, everybody can come to their own conclusions. The, the one question uh, I do want to focus on is, is this good for stocks? Um, and, and look, the answer to that, and it's, I think it's okay to say the answer is no. I, I think all too often uh, government policies and politicians get way too much credit, uh, whether good or bad for the stock market. Uh, but one lever they can pull it is tax rates. And when taxes go up on the selling of an asset class like stocks, uh, you can expect that to be a headwind for, for that asset class. But like the second thing I want to add is like, should that change your investment strategy? Uh, you know, even if even if that does affect you, even if you do fall in that income range, which obviously won't be for most people. But if you do fall in that asset class, like if you do fall in that income range, should that change your investment strategy? Absolutely. We should change everything. No, of course not. Um, you, you should still be looking for companies with competitive advantages and growing markets at decent valuations and hold for the long term. I also expect, and again, this is not an official plan. This was sort of floated out there. I feel like this is a trial balloon to see sort of what the public pushback is. And what people are missing is that if you are a multimillionaire, you have options. You don't have to invest in the stock market. You can do other things with your money. Keeping that money out of the, the market, Matt, that's not good for, for Joe Little Guy, right? And, I, and I'll include myself in that, that list. We want sort of as much money put into the market as possible within reason. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and like, you know, I've, I, I do wish the, the political class would like, uh, would recognize, like make, make a, big, a bigger recognition for like short-term capital gains uh, taxes and, and, and long-term gains. Um, you know, like uh, today on Twitter, I forget who, but somebody suggested like, you know, how about no capital gains taxes for, uh, for, for assets held over five years? You know, I would, I would love to see like more thinking like that, more encouragement, more, uh, incentivizing for, for long-term holding of, of, 
of stocks or any asset really, but like, uh, you know, and more of like, you know, for, for day traders and things like that, like that's more speculative market and not an investing market. Um, you know, I wish there was more of a distinction made, uh, you know, but, but yeah. I, I think it's part of the reason seven investing exists. And I'm going to bring Simon into this. Uh, most people in Congress are wealthy. And when you're wealthy, I think you think the stock market is something only wealthy people can use. And here's the reality. The average person has exposure to the stock market in their 401k. I don't know the percentage of Americans who have a 401k, but it's reasonably high. It's, it's a and pensions. Percentage. And pensions. Mm -hmm. and, and pensions. But what we're doing here at 7 Investing is we're telling, you know, I, I talked about this a couple weeks ago. I met with a 17-year-old who has a very small amount of money, but he's going to steadily invest in the market. We want to tell anybody that they can be in the market and they can take advantage of these gains. And we also want to tell them that we hope they can become a millionaire because of it. I am pretty sure raising the capital gains tax on long-term capital gains disincentivizes people from going into the market. And that can have a catastrophic uh, you know, effect, Simon. If you take $100 a month and put it in a savings account or a CD or lots of uh, a bond, your returns are going to be abysmal. Even at historic highs, they are going to underperform the market. So how do we get government? And Simon, I'll let you answer this impossible question because there's no answer for it. Uh, how do you get government to understand that we should be encouraging the stock market as a way to create wealth, not just something for the wealthy? Well, I, I think it comes back to Matt's point that he made that the there's evolution and innovation in how people are saving money. You know, we, we from the 401k plan that was launched, and then you have the Roth IRA in 1997. You know, there were there has been regulations that have encouraged people to save money, either pre-tax or after tax, into taking care of yourself later in life, and that gives you uh, not only the burden, which some people see it as a burden, I see it as an opportunity to break away from you know the, the, the small chart that says, here's your four options you can invest in your company's 401k plan. Now you can go out and actually buy individual stocks and we've got access to so much more information. To your point, Dan, that is why 7investing exists. And so maybe we don't let the tail wag the dog on this one. You know, Tax rates are gonna be what tax rates are gonna be. I think bigger picture, when you're thinking about this over decades, you want to be investing in the stock market. You want to be more actionable in taking control of your financial future. Uh, Joyce Hine, I'm gonna I'm gonna take your comment as meaning all politicians. Uh, they understand, but they don't care. I actually don't think that's true. I think we saw this with the the internet hearings. Uh, you know, when when Facebook and the other tech companies came in and spoke to Congress. I think you're largely speaking to old people, and I'm not sure. You know, we 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 had that litmus test for a million years when we'd ask presidential candidates the price of a gallon of milk. I'm not so sure the average person in Congress understands what a family making 80 grand a year is doing with their investing and, and that they could be making money in the stock market. And that, you know, if the government cared or understood investing, it would be taught in schools. And it's not. There is not basic financial literacy taught in most schools in this country. Uh, so I do think it's a whole. Matt Cochran, you wanted to chime in. Yeah. And, and to your point, Dan, uh, about like the middle class, like being being invested in the stock market, like, you know, you'll, you'll always see those statistics that show like, you know, the top 2% of, you know, net worth individuals own like 80% of the stock market or things like that. And of course, right? I mean, like Jeff Bezos alone owns about like a, approximately 80 gazillion dollars worth of Amazon stock, you know, uh, Bill Gates owns a, a gazillion dollars, you know, uh, of, of Microsoft stock still, uh, you know, uh, Warren Buffett owns a gazillion dollars of, of Berkshire Hathaway stock. And it takes a lot. I mean, I, it takes like hundreds of thousands or maybe even millions of, you know, middle class investors to even match one of those. Right. But as far as like a percentage of the middle class's net worth, like is in the stock market, it, it is there. Like, I mean, I work at a, you know, I, I work at a municipality where everybody's into the pension plan. That pension plan is invested uh, 60 percent into the stock market. Uh, you know, 401ks are, are huge. I mean, so so those kinds of stats, I think, like get get thrown around too much and, and taken out of context. And, uh, you know, you, they, they don't tell the story that like that's true because people like that alone will like throw off that 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 average. But the middle class is definitely 100 percent in, invested in the stock market. And I think it's important to remember, and, and, and I'll sort of take the last word here, though. We're going to take uh, a couple of comments from Ravi Shah, Sam. So uh, one, one functional, one, uh, one about this. But 
when the government is doing anything, it's a negotiation. We have we have a two party government. So the president is is leaking out that this is what he wants. There could be pushback, and that pushback may be well, we won't have an increase in the capital gains tax, but we will revert income tax rates, which affect short term capital gains and. So this is likely a negotiating play. I actually don't see this as a serious political play. You might see people over a million dollars, the rate tweaks up a few points or, you know, even then it becomes very difficult because like, okay, this year I only made $900,000. I'll sell a whole bunch of stocks and there's ways to engineer your income. So it doesn't look like you made a million dollars that year. We don't want to add that layer of complexity to, to, to these transactions. So I really do think you're going to probably see an attempt to revert some of the previous tax cuts on very, very high income earners. Uh, I doubt this is gonna go through, but remember the stock market often reacts very, very harshly to very minor short-term news. The possibility a politician might try to do something is not actually a news story. It's the beginning of a news story. And that's kind of what this is here. We're gonna talk in a minute about AI, but before we do that, uh, functional question from Ravi Shah, uh, as members, are we supposed to get emails when subscriber calls happen? Yes, uh, we do send out emails. Uh, we don't over email you. We only send out, what is it, Simon? Maybe at max two emails a week between- For one a week. In and you can actually opt yeah. into more of those if you want. And, and Robbie, thank you for this question. Uh, we do the week of the subscriber call. We send out an invitation for everyone who's currently subscribed to 7investing. Uh, you do have to opt in in your profile if you wanna receive our emails. But as long as that's checked and you're opted in, uh, you will get an invitation uh, for basically the third Friday of every month is when we host our subscriber calls. So if you're a member and you are not getting those invitations, shoot us an email at info at seveninvesting.com uh, and Steve Symington will absolutely take care of that. But let's take Ravi's second comment to close out this topic, if you can bring it up, Sam Bailey. Uh, the more you sell, the more taxes you pay. So I would think government would care more about short-term capital gains tax than long-term mat. Am I correct in saying short-term capital gains is just income? Uh, yeah, I, I think I think that's, yeah, basically, yeah, I think that's correct, yes. So I do think you might see tweaks to the income tax rates. And I actually think it's a great thing if you disincentivize short-term selling. If you, if you make it so people hold stocks, one, they're gonna consider them more carefully. You're not gonna get this uh, you know, retail mania buying that we've seen. You're actually gonna see more people seek out good companies and buy and hold them. Stability is actually really good for the stock market, but we are running out of time. So I wanna pivot here. Uh, Simon, we are getting into the future. We're not quite in that uh, Tom Cruise movie where magic people can tell us when there's gonna be a murder, but facial recognition minority AI- Minority Report, right? Yeah, I remember yes, that. Minor yes, Minority Report. We are getting into a time where AI and facial recognition are getting a little bit scary. Why don't you comment there? Yeah, this is great. So we just saw the EU kind of propose a bill that would start being a, a broader uh, definition of how AI, which is artificial intelligence, should be regulated. And this is a really, really long bill, but one of them that stands out as kind of uh, the bedrocks of it is facial recognition. How could and how should facial recognition be regulated? And so we've started to get in the era now of Facebook can recognize that I've got a picture of you, Dan, and Matt with me. And then it automatically says, oh, there's Dan and there's Matt in the background. And it automatically wants to tag you. And we think, oh, this is kind of fun. I'm friends with these people on Facebook. But then what if we have cameras set up around cities that is also recognizing me, Dan, and Matt in a certain area? If we're all sitting at a Starbucks, is it OK for Starbucks to have that data without our consent of it recognizing our pictures and saying, hey, I want to give you coupons because we saw you were at Starbucks picked up from a camera like this. Or even a step further, say that there was a riot going on in that block where the Starbucks we were. And now all of a sudden those cameras saw that you, me and Matt were all in the middle of that riot and it puts it on a list of a, of a watch list because these people were in the place of the riot. I mean, things like this, there's not a whole lot of definition about how that data, first of all, can be shared and used. And then secondly, how AI and machine learning can be manipulating that. And this so, is very, so, very, very, very important, Dan. It's interesting to see you, the EU starting to take the first steps on this. This is a real slippery slope because I would argue, Simon, that on an opt-in basis, that Starbucks example is awesome. So if I walk into the mall and while I'm in the mall, I turn on, send me mall offers as I walk by stores or incentivize me, you know, so maybe the movie theater could go, wow, the one o'clock showing is sell we've sold no tickets. 
I'm going to lower the price compared to the five o'clock showing. Uh, or a restaurant could say, hey, if you get here by 515, uh, and it's Florida, so 515 is actually late for dinner for, for many people. Uh, <laughs> but if you get here by 430, we will give you a free appetizer. I think there's some great marketing on an opt-in basis. From a criminal basis, and Matt, if you want to weigh in on this, I think it's awesome when you're watching Law and Order and they use like a you know a neighborhood camera, a street cam, you know, to identify where the murderer was or where the rapist was. I'm not so sure I want them to identify where the guy who didn't pay his parking ticket is. I think there is a a line. And Simon, how do we decide what that line is? Is it capital crimes? Is it you know crimes you could go to jail for more than X amount of years? Is it violent crimes? It's a really tricky decision, right? Yeah, it sure is. Go ahead, Matt. If you want to chime in for the law enforcement question. Oh, uh, well, no, I mean, it, it's a, it, it's, it's a weighty question, right? I mean, on, on one hand, you, you want to put criminals away on the, on the other hand, uh, like that's the same, uh, you know, even, even, even worse than parking tickets. How about you're just at a, a peaceful protest, but you know, you're identified being in that crowd and you're punished by your employer. Or, you know, there's a public backlash and, and people start tagging you on social media and, and, and you know, cancel culture, you know, and, and cancel you on social media or, or whatever. I, it's a very tricky question. I, I, I don't have I don't I don't I don't know if I have the answers, um, but there's a, there's a lot of thought that needs to be put into it for sure. Yeah. And, and there's also like some social aspect of it. Like what if Simon pops up as being at a BTS concert uh, without his daughter? And then it's like, ooh, like, should Simon go on a watch list? Like, that's a little bit. So there is some minority report preemptive layers. This is not a discussion we are going to solve today. This is actually going to be one of the principal discussions, I think, of the next decade. Because we are going to get into that sci-fi space of where it becomes pretty tricky to commit a crime because everything is on camera. You have that uh, in parts of the world. China, famous for that. And there, there might be, and Simon, I'll let you weigh in a second. There will be implied consent when you go to, say, the Olympics. It's going to be right on your ticket that you agree that your image could be used. That, I mean, that, that happens at any sporting event now. It's really the public streets and public places. If I'm sitting outside a Starbucks, what's the legality there? But, Simon, this was your topic. I'll give you the last word. I, I think that is the most important part, Dan, is that this is going to be a very, very difficult question that is going to be addressed for probably the next decade. And I think my final word on this is that the internet and actually just technology in general is still a layer beneath the government. When you think about this, we always talk about the internet as though it's a universal concept and it's not. You know, regulations and censorship in China are very, very different than the United States. We saw GDPR with EU, uh, EU a couple of years ago saying, hey, if you do not comply with GDPR, there's going to be a 4% royalty that you're going to have to pay to us. And so everybody immediately complied to that. This is the next evolution of that. But again, AI is, is overarching. Facial recognition could be anywhere. If we're traveling to China, do we give implicit consent for China, who is very open for police to be using facial recognition and cameras around city centers? Are we then playing by those rules? Yes, we are, because that's the government of the country that we're in at the point. And that's very different than Europe. And so when we talk about things like innovation and pace of innovation and who's out... Who's got the greatest technology in the world? I mean, things like this play a really, really big factor. It's a tough question to answer, depending on which side of this uh, you tend to favor. But it's it's going to be contentious and a lot of controversy with this one coming up. This, of course, is why I never leave the house without a full-on Boba Fett helmet. Uh, no, I'm teasing a little bit because the balance between privacy and safety is very different for 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 people, and there's no right answer. Uh, and from a law enforcement point of view, of course, you want to be able to get every you know significant criminal easily, but there is a cost for that. So we're going to see technology, like just like we have radar detectors, we're probably going to see someone invent facial obscures. And you know, we're, we're also living in a society now where wearing a mask in public is acceptable. I mean, if you walked into a convenience store in a, in a kerchief around your neck, that wasn't allowed at a 7-Eleven you know, a year ago. And now it's not only allowed, it's absolutely encouraged. Uh, Steve Symington shares a sort of technical note. If you are a member or just someone who emails us at info at 7investing.com, uh, be sure to add us to your safe senders uh, because it is possible an overzealous spam filter. Here's what I'll also say. If you email us and we do not respond within 24 hours, hit us up on Twitter, at 7investing. It means we didn't get your email or you asked an impossible to answer question. But for the or, most part, it means or, we didn't or, get your email. Or, or somebody check in on Steve and make sure he's okay. Yeah, bear <laughs> on that email like nothing. 
Steve checks most of our email. He is not the only person with access to that account. So we do still answer it in the rare time where Steve is out wrestling bears or hunting mountain lions or, or whatever passes for, for fun in Montana. Uh, we are near the end of the show. Uh, Oh, I recorded an interview with Anurban Mahante on how he handles his family's finances. It's illuminating. It's uh, It touches on some discussions. It's probably one you should watch with your kids. Uh, and we are going to air that on Monday show. This show just spiraled out of control. This wasn't, we were going to talk about airlines and play Anurban's interview. We didn't talk about either of those things because we let what you want to talk about dictate what's going to happen. And this seemed much higher need to talk about uh, the housing market and the capital gains tax. But Sam Bailey, let's climb up on the top rope and hit our finisher. Which company has improved its long-term business prospects the most during the pandemic? Uh, you picked Chipotle, uh, yeah. and that is Chipotle reported this week, and their digital numbers were incredible. I actually think they were going to do what they were doing anyway. I actually think the answer here is Walmart. I think this forced Walmart to speed up curbside pickup, which customers really like. Uh, it, it forced them to sort of prove they could do grocery well, which is a business that will drive sales for them. Uh, but I'm not necessarily right. Simon Erickson, which one would it be for you? I would have voted B, Starbucks, but I defer to you because you are the retail guru, Dan. Yeah, I actually think Starbucks didn't change their business that much because they were already doing delivery. They've gained a little bit of optionality in terms of uh, curbside pickup and and uh, making the drive through a little bit easier. But Starbucks had already built that in. So I think they've shown an amazing resilience in the fact that our entire commute pattern has changed and Starbucks sales have recovered and their dining rooms are still not open in most places. Uh, but I don't think actually that much changed. I actually think Starbucks and McDonald's were two companies that were way ahead of the curve in terms of dealing with the pandemic. Now, was that because they thought a pandemic was coming? No, it was because Starbucks constantly, from an operational point of view, goes, how do we do things better? How do we make this more convenient for our customers? It's like in some stores, uh, mobile order and pay is handled at the same place regular orders are. In some stores, there's like a separate counter for it. They've, they, they constantly tweak their operations to make the experience good. Uh, and I will argue that that is not something Dunkin' Donuts or Panera does. I would say the experience at both of those is meaningfully less good uh, because they're not making those efforts. They don't put customers first. Uh, Matt, do you want to weigh in on this topic? Yeah, I, I think the stock is too expensive, but Chipotle, I don't think, I don't know if any restaurant was better prepared to have like such a, a, a sanitized, uh, like, and, uh, you know, a, a sanitized like uh, kitchen and uh, a digitized uh, sales channel too, like through their app and uh, through like Chipotle lanes that they're introducing in a lot of their stores. So I think uh, like the pandemic was perfectly timed for Chipotle. I'm a little bit biased because I've been through the Chipotle lane twice and it's a dreadful experience. It's, you have to order on your phone. They don't take orders like the way a traditional drive-through does. And like half the customers don't know that. So they get to the front and place an order and then they have to like direct them to go to the pickup area. And every order is put in the same sealed brown bag and they have to hunt through all the orders. I think it's a lot like Walmart and, and two-day shipping they will get there, they're not there yet. I think the execution at Chipotle has a long way to go. I do love what they did making the quesadilla app order only. And by the way, if you go into a Chipotle and you order a quesadilla, they're gonna take the order, but they are encouraging app orders only. So I think all these companies are coming out of the pandemic stronger, uh, but I would lean towards Walmart, but you did not agree, uh, you voted Chipotle. And that brings us to the end of this edition of 7 Investing Now. Did not intend to go quite this long, uh, but your questions, a uh, great topic, made it that long. Of course, if you want to get a hold of us, you can reach us at info at 7investing.com. That is questions about your membership, questions about the various things we do. Maybe you're thinking about joining, have questions about uh, you know what you get for that, whatever it is, info at 7investing.com. And if you want to interact with us, if you want to Help us by telling your friends about this show and all the great things we do at 7investing. Why don't you retweet some of the things we post at 7investing? Uh, I think there are hundreds of thousands of potential investors uh, or people who are trading and not investing that would profit from listening to our podcast, watching 7investing now, and of course joining, but that doesn't have to be the first step. So, you know, we feel like there's a nation of 7investors out there, people who are giant fans of the show, thousands of you. Uh, watch this program, listen to our podcast, get the word out and share it with your friends because you'll be helping them. It is the best 
present you can give them. For that, uh, with that, I am Dan Klein. For Sam Bailey, who joined us today, for Simon Erickson, for Matt Cochran, thank you for watching 7 Investing Now. We will see you Monday.